Alors, bonsoir à, à tout le monde. Euh, mesdames, Messieurs, je suis vraiment ravi de, de vous accueillir à cette euh, conférence organisée par la Fondation de Jean Monnet pour l'Europe. Je suis Pat Cox, président de la Fondation. J'ai été président du Parlement européen et président du Mouvement européen international. Je, je vais parler en anglais ce soir, mais sur l'Ukraine. Et euh, je ne veux pas parler trop de moi-même, mais seulement pour créer un peu les liens. Depuis une décennie, j'ai eu des contacts très étroits avec l'Ukraine. Euh, comme ancien président du Parlement européen, on m'a invité il y a dix ans avec l'ancien président polonais Kwasniewski d'aller en Ukraine pour négocier pour des prisonniers à l'époque, vous comme prisonniers politiques, mis en prison par l'ancien président, le président Yanukovych. Et peut-être la plus fameuse des, des quelques prisonniers était Yula Timoshenko à l'époque. Puis après Maïdan, après la révolution de Maïdan en, en, en 2014, on m'a invité de la part du Parlement européen et de Verkhovna Rada, le Parlement ukrainien, de revenir en Ukraine pour assister avec un projet du Parlement européen, Verkhovna Rada, pour la réforme institutionnelle et la modernisation de leur Parlement. Et depuis là, je suis associé bénévolement, je, je dois souligner, avec ce projet qui m'a touché beaucoup. J'ai beaucoup d'amis là-bas, j'ai beaucoup de contacts avec mes amis, j'ai beaucoup de soucis personnels et j'ai le privilège cet après-midi de partager avec vous euh, une analyse sur, de mon part, acceptable ou contesté, c'est pour vous, euh, de ce, qu -ce qui passe euh, là-bas. Au nom de, fédération, de, de la Fondation, excusez-moi, je voudrais remercier le canton de Vaud, la Confédération suisse et la ville de Lausanne, et surtout, et bien sûr, l'Université de Lausanne, de leur soutien inestimable. Notre événement est également retransmis en live sur YouTube, et si vous nous suivez à distance, vous pouvez poser des questions euh, si vous euh, voudrez euh, sur le chat. Nous avons plus tard le plaisir de renouer avec la tradition apéritif euh, offerte par les directions de l'Université de Lausanne après la conférence. Et par ailleurs, évidemment, j'aimerais bien remercier l'Université de Lausanne de son aide précieuse à l'organisation de cet événement. Et aussi mes remerciements à l'équipe de la Fondation pour euh, la préparation de cette conférence. Euh, plus tard, euh, j'aurai un grand ami et un membre de notre conseil exécutif sur l'écran de la Moldovie, Jan Tombinski, euh, un diplomate polonais, européen, renommé. J'ai rencontré Jan il y a dix ans à Kiev où il était l'ambassadeur de l'Union européenne auprès de l'Ukraine pendant cinq ans. Et donc, euh, Yann est très bien placé pour ajouter euh, ses, euh, ses, euh, son expérience professionnelle et personnelle, et même aujourd'hui en Moldavie. So, to my topic. The topic is the war in Ukraine and I was asked to talk about confronting the new reality. I propose at the outset to talk about President Putin as a vital part of that reality, then to talk about some of the consequences that so far have flowed from the war, and then at the very end, um, a short but necessary part of the reality is to recognize the war itself and not just these wider geopolitical uh, issues that arise. 
I think today is 61, if it's not, it's day 62, my counting may be right or wrong, of the war in Ukraine. I would call it Vladimir Putin's war of choice. And it's a war of choice that dare not speak its name in Russia. Accepting the implosion of former Yugoslavia, Europe's longest period of peace between states has come to an end. And I must say I'm very pleased to see two old friends today in the audience who travelled here from Kosovo. I met them first during the Kosovo crisis and they came and visited my family and my friends in Cork in Ireland in 1999 and I haven't seen them since. And I'm filled with emotion. Jared, filled with emotion to see you. When the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, the collapse of the Iron Curtain, the Warsaw Pact, and the implosion of the Soviet Union followed. Europe enjoyed a peace dividend. The Cold War was over, but history had not ended. I don't want to go into the cul-de-sac debate among academics about whether Fukuyama was right or wrong and so on, but history had not ended. In Europe, it slowly metastasized under Putin's increasingly dictatorial leadership and now has returned with a vengeance. We have entered a new age of uncertainty, obliging us to evaluate and to address the new reality. In the starkest terms, in Europe, we're witnessing a confrontation between democracy and dictatorship and Ukraine is its first line of defense. Putin and Russia is worth considering. Vladimir Putin's control over the levers of power in Russia has become virtually all-embracing. Having railed against what he described as Western propaganda, suggesting that the war was imminent in the light of massive Russian troop buildups along Ukraine's borders, Putin, in his words, launched not a war, but a special military operation. Believing his own propaganda that a sovereign Ukraine is a threat to Russia, he decided to get his retaliation in first. The registration of 15 representative offices of international organizations, among them Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, was revoked. Dissent has been criminalized. People are fined and risk imprisonment for up to 15 years for calling a war a war. Reports suggest that up to 15,000 Russians have been arrested for protesting against the war. Russia's last independent media outlets have been closed. Kremlin-dominated print and broadcast media outlets totally control and disseminate the nation's deceitful war narrative, presenting Russia as liberator, not aggressor, presenting Russia as defender and not despoiler of human rights, as avoiding civilian war targets while laying waste at the same time to homes, hospitals, schools, and turning entire cities to rubble. And, of course, Russia says it's a victim of fake news when it's presented with incontrovertible evidence of uh, what look like uh, war crimes. Setting the tone from the top, Putin on the 16th of March, just a few weeks ago, called for acts, and these are his words, of self-purification of society within Russia against those who questioned his invasion, describing them, the president of a state, publicly on television, describing them as scum and traitors to be spat out on the pavement for undermining the unity of the nation. Opposition has been crushed. Putin's opponents, as you know, have been poisoned, assassinated, and imprisoned. His closest associates have been promoted, empowered, and enriched. Over the past two decades, Russia has been transformed into a securocrat and kleptocrat-led plutocracy, with a thin veneer of democracy, veneer of democracy with no effective checks and balances, and marked outstandingly by elite impunity. Increasingly, Putin's rule has transformed into a dictatorship in a society used to autocratic leadership. His military adventurism has been rewarded insofar 
uh, so far, as the significant rise in popularity looking at the Nevada Center's polls indicates, his, his support has grown to 83% since the war was launched. I believe Putin's risk appetite has grown as his grip on Russia tightened. He has gambled his standing in Russian history, his future, and that of his accommodating elite on the outcome of this war. He clearly dominates his narrow circle of advisors, as you will have seen in televised pre-war spectacles uh, that were revealed of him putting down and keeping in place the Siloviki reporting into them. He relished his central standalone role when celebrating the eighth anniversary of Crimea's annexation at Moscow's Luzhniki Stadium on the 18th of March, surrounded by the Z symbol and a flag-waving crowd. Paradoxically, in the light of his anti-Ukrainian propaganda and standing on her banners reading for a world without Nazism, this coup de théâtre evoked for me, and I suspect for many who watched it, memories closer to Leni Riefenstahl's Nazi propaganda and scenes that she put together to promote Hitler's Germany. One year ago, Putin signed a law allowing him to run for two more six-year presidential terms, potentially keeping him in office until 2036. This was validated by rewriting the Constitution through a consultation process whose single vote included what I've just said, plus multiple other changes like improvements in pensions and minimum wage, and in a genuflection towards orthodox conservatism by adding constitutional references to faith in God and a ban on gay marriage. According to official results, 79% of valid votes supported the changes to the Constitution. Quel surprise. Putin, should he decide and live to do so in good health, could serve longer in the highest office in the state than Joseph Stalin had served longer than any other Moscow leader since the longest surviving Romanovs of an earlier time. I want to reflect for a moment on Putin and the Orthodox Church. During his multiple terms in office, Putin has carefully cultivated an alliance with the Russian Orthodox Church, and this plays a key role in shaping and validating his vision of Russia today. Since the collapse of communism, all church property seized by the Soviets was returned. The Russian Orthodox Church has the right to teach in all state schools. At least 25,000 new churches have been built or restored since the early 1990s, most in Vladimir Putin's time. State-owned enterprises and well-connected oligarchs have been in the vanguard of this massive patronage. The church in Russia is believed to have more than 100 million members. This marriage of convenience between a strongman leader and the church carries echoes of Russia's imperial past. They both promote the Ruski Mir, the Russian world concept, comprising a degree of nostalgic nationalism with a revanchist neo-Soviet aspiration to restore influence in the former Soviet unions near abroad. Its civilizational space finds expression through Eastern Orthodoxy, Russian culture and language, and links between historical memory and con contemporary nativism. Putin has never accepted the verdict of history of 1991. Nostalgia for an idealized past and the need or the felt need to right past wrongs has made, seen by Putin, of course, as moments of historical weakness for Russia. These should not be underestimated in the mobilization of popular opinion the response to a feeling of humiliation. And history's full of this stuff. Adolf Hitler got his take off because of a sense of humiliation after the Versailles Treaty and excessive reparation payments. So we know this from history. I digress anyway from the text I have in front of me, but this kind of thing is not new. Russian ideologues and nativists promote the dream of Eurasian Union, having Mother Russia at its heart and asserting a right to defend the interests of co-ethnics, of other Russians abroad, thus self-indicating interventions in Georgia, Crimea, Donbass, and now the current war in Ukraine. 
Among Putin's staunchest allies is the Russian Orthodox patriarch Kirill. In the past, Kirill has described Putin's strongman rule following the chaos of Boris Yeltsin's years as, and I quote, a miracle of God. In a sermon delivered on the 6th of March, before the start of this year's Orthodox Lent, Kirill echoed Putin's unfounded claims that Ukraine was engaged in the extermination of Russian loyalists in Donbass. Kirill focused virtually all of his talk on the war in Donbass and made no mention whatsoever of Russia's widespread invasion and bombardment of innocent civilians and civilian targets across Ukraine. He chose to portray the war in spiritual terms. Again, I quote, we have, he said, entered into a struggle that has not a physical but a metaphysical significance, close quote. Suggesting, while referring to gay parades, that some of the Donbass separatists were suffering for their, quote, fundamental rejection of the so-called values that are offered by those who claim world power, close quote. As they celebrated the Orthodox Easter last weekend, Orthodox Christians across the region were more divided by nationality than united by religious belief. Putin and Ukraine. This, I'll give you the telegram version, but this or the telegrammatic version of this, but it's long. When launching the war on the 24th of February, Putin insisted he was fighting to save the Russian-speaking community in eastern Ukraine, saying his words, our goal is to protect the people who are subjected to abuse and genocide from the Kiev regime, close quote. He extended the war aims by adding, quote, to this end, we will seek to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine and bring to justice those that have committed numerous bloody crimes against people, against peaceful people, including Russian nationals, close quote. Putin's obsession with Ukraine is not new. In 2002, he did a deal with the outgoing second-term president, Leonid Kuchma, and encouraged Kuchma to appoint a strongman politician from Donetsk called Viktor Yanukovych as prime minister. And this happened in 2002, year two of Putin's term in office. Yanukovych shared Kuchma's orientation more towards Moscow than the West. They decided Yanukovych would be the presidential election candidate in 2004. Putin and the Kremlin openly backed Yanukovych in the campaign and made it clear who their choice was. Another politician, Viktor Yushchenko, contested. They, he was pro-Western in his orientation. They sought to assassinate him. They poisoned him. He survived through treatment in an Austrian clinic. He went home and he fought the election again in, the, in, in November of that year. And according to the exit polls, Yushchenko came out ahead. But according to the official results, he came out behind. And that triggered the Orange Revolution in Maidan and in Ukraine. And the Orange Revolution led to interventions to try to square the circle. Everything was referred to the Supreme Court of Ukraine. They nullified the election, called for a new election and for proper supervision and quelle surprise. Mr. Yushchenko won on this occasion. But that wasn't the end of it. Now that Yushchenko was in government and Timoshenko was his prime minister, Putin decided to weaponize the energy weapon of the price of gas between Russia and Ukraine, starting in 2006 and deeply intensifying it in a bitterly cold winter in 2009. He ended up doing a deal with Timoshenko, over which he had no choice, and massively ramped up the price of gas, giving Yanukovych the causes belli politically to recontest the elections in 2010, which he duly won. And what did he do? He promptly bowed to Russian power, and in April 2010, did a deal with the Russian president for that moment, Dmitry Medvedev, as you remember the tandem, Putin sat on the back of the bicycle and for five years or whatever the number of years was, Medvedev got to sit in the front. 
Uh, he did a deal for a long-term lease to the Russian Black Sea Fleet in Sebastopol, extending up to 2042, and what did he get? A reduction in the price of gas. And so it was the perfect circle in the weaponization of the energy price. Now, all this stuff happened, and we kind of know about it, but it is El Wanye. It's somewhere over there. And if it's over there, it's out of sight, out of mind. And so we really didn't pay so much attention. In March 2012, the Yanukovych administration initialed an agreement, initialed, not yet signed, actually to have an association agreement with the EU and to develop a deep and comprehensive free trade area. And this was because, bit by bit, the oligarchy and others in Ukraine saw it as worthwhile for Ukraine more to offer the rule of law than the somewhat dubious brotherly love that was on offer from the Russians. And so, biding his time, Putin's next big intervention, and I was in Ukraine at the time, in fact, when he started it, I was in Yalta. And in Yalta, I was in the villa of Yanukovych, trying to negotiate prisoner releases at that time, and Putin started a commercial war. He stopped everything that was coming into Russia from Ukraine and expressly targeted all those goods whose production base was in the Donbass, which area was the base of the party of the regions, which party was the party of the president. Ukraine also had a macroeconomic crisis at the time. The IMF said, we'll give you money, but with conditions. And the condition is that the price of gas you charge to people, commercial and other users, has to be at a market price. Yanukovych wanted to run in the election in 2014. He didn't want a high price of gas getting in the way, so he didn't want to do the deal. Putin put $15 billion equivalent on the table as a macroeconomic uh, sweetener on top, on top of all of the commercial threats. Yanukovych relented. I was sat in his office with Kwetnevsky when he told us, you can phone Brussels and tell them I've hit the pause button. And one week later in Vilnius at an Eastern Partnership Summit, Yanukovych showed up and didn't sign the deal. That was the 28th of November, I think, of 2013. And when he flew home that night, students from the universities in Kiev were protesting at the failure to sign on Maidan. And resorting to the typical homo sovieticus response, he set the Berkut, a hardline security police, on the students and they beat the hell out of them. And people were so disgusted with what they saw, the students beating mobilized an entire society. And in spite of bitterly cold winter, the Christmas holiday period, and a very long period of protest, Maidan never folded up for several more uh, months. And all of that, you had the hand of Putin uh, and his uh, puppets uh, involved in, in, in all of this. I want to pause, if I could, to reflect with you on Maidan itself, on what happened. I think it's a key to understanding Russian-Ukrainian relations today, and it merits consideration. For the vast bulk of Ukrainians, the Maidan revolution is referred to as the revolution of dignity. Maidan started with the students I've described and ended up with the flight of Yanukovych in February of 2014. Like any mass movement, it's diverse and attracted many strands. But Putin has chosen to describe it from the outset. He said there may have been some good people, but that it was anti-Semite, Russophobe, neo-Nazi. This is a big lie. It was a lie at the beginning. It's a lie ever since, and it's a lie today. And no amount of Russian repetition and propaganda should be allowed to defame what Ukrainians themselves wanted. They wanted change and not vague promises. They wanted to rid their country of corruption, and it was among the most corrupt in Europe. They saw the EU in that idealized sense as a beacon of freedom, democracy, hope, and opportunity. They were choosing to step into a different future and refusing to step back into a jaded past. These people were not the stooges of some external manipulating hidden hand. I believe the movement in Maidan, which saw men, women, and children, and you don't bring your kids to a neo-Nazi revolution, 
in Maidan, sometimes close to a million people came at weekends when they were free from work. This came from somewhere deep within the consciousness and the will of Ukrainians themselves. The old style crackdowns came back. Laws were introduced that criminalized any protester and therefore hundreds of thousands of ordinary Ukrainians. This resulted in some deaths on Maidan and fearing a, a worse conflagration, the laws were withdrawn. But on the 20th of February 2014, more than 100 protesters were gunned down on Independence Square in the heart of Kyiv. Public opinion was outraged. The foreign ministers of Germany, France, Poland, and Vladimir Lukin, President Putin's personal representative, together with Yanukovych and opposition leaders in Kyiv, met until the early hours of the 21st of February 2014. They concluded a deal witnessed and signed by all except Lukin, who represented Putin. Sensing the game was up, Yanukovych and his closest allies packed up and fled to Russia. The vast majority of Ukrainians were exhilarated. Putin was outraged. And he seized the moment to redouble his propaganda that Maidan was a neo-Nazi, Russophobe conspiracy. With breathtaking opportunism, Putin seized control of Crimea in March 2014, annexed it, and superficially validated that by a referendum. At the same time, he unleashed, but with maximum deniability, pro-Russian protests right across the Donbass, including, by the way, in Mariupol, Dnipro, and other cities, who resisted and threw them out. But in some places, they got a foothold, and they stayed in the so-called Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. They were armed and Russian-backed separatist groups, and they seized government buildings throughout Donbass. That has gone on for eight years. I'm not going to go into it, but the Minsk treaties, they had 21 or 29 ceasefires, they all broke down. And from Kiev's point of view, they regarded Moscow as waging an undeclared war in the region and supplying troops and heavy weapons while denying it. The current invasion, which follows that sequence of in deep engagement in Moscow, in the Kremlin, by Putin, is a war of choice. And so to me it begs the question, after so many years of overt and covert interference in Ukraine's affairs, why did Putin choose to strike now? The COVID pandemic seems to have drawn Putin into an extreme level of self-isolation, witnessed by his preferences for video engagement with senior advisors, or when meeting in person, going to extreme lengths to physically distance himself from his interlocutors. One memory will stick with me early in the war was Putin sat way over there and Minister Shoigu, the defense minister, and General Gerasimov looked like they were in Ukraine. They were so far away at the other end of a long table. And we saw it, I think, also signaling diplomatic isolation with Macron and Schultz before the war started, you know, éloigné, far apart, to make a bigger point than social distancing to do with COVID. The director of the CIA, Bill Burns, in a lecture given recently in Georgia Tech, and in my view I think it's correct, says of Putin, and I quote, he's stewed in a combustible combination of grievance, ambition, and insecurity, close quote. This powerful blend, fermenting in Putin's mind, yielded an extraordinary 7,000 word essay. If you want to read it, go to the Kremlin website, you'll get it in all uh, European languages, published last July in Putin's name. It's called On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians. He argued that Ukraine as a state was an unreal construction created thanks to Russia, and that the Ukrainian nation and Russians are parts of a single people belonging to the same historical spiritual space. If that is Putin's dream, his insecure nightmare is of a colored revolution of the sort that set Ukraine on such a different course to Russia. Putin dismisses Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic orientation not as a sovereign choice, but as, and I quote, the result of deliberate efforts by those forces that have always sought to undermine our unity. He sees Ukraine's choice not as Ukrainian, but being manipulated by those in the West whom he sees as Russia's enemy. 
prefiguring his self-declared or self-described war of liberation, liberation. His essay concluded by arguing, and I want to quote this to you. He said, I am confident that true sovereignty of Ukraine is possible only in partnership with Russia. Our spiritual, human, and civilizational ties formed for centuries and have their origins in the same sources. They've been hardened by common trials, achievements, and victories. Our kinship has been transmitted from generation to generation, end quote. That kinship today is being transmitted through bombs and bullets in a reign of war and criminal terror visited upon the civilian population and infrastructure of Ukraine through destruction, death, displacement, injury, rape, and torture. I want to turn to Putin's perception of the West. If dominance at home and an obsession with Ukraine are one part of the explanation for going to war, Putin's perception of the apparent weakness of his enemies abroad was another. Fortified by his anticipated no limits friendship with China's Xi Jinping and convinced of the limits of the Biden administration and NATO's capacity to act after the debacle of the withdrawal from Afghanistan, Putin proceeded with his invasion plans. The war in Donbass and the annexation of Crimea resulted in sanctions that for Putin amounted to no more than a slap in the wrist after 2014. Talk of rapprochement and strategic engagement returned. By way of example, and I don't single it out, I could give you lots, but this comes to my mind because of the week that's in it. Le President Macron received Putin personally in France on the eve of a French-hosted G7 meeting in 2019, five years after Crimea. He couldn't bring him to the G7 because lots of the others wouldn't sit at the same table. And interestingly, it's not in my speech, but at a press conference when it finished, you might think he might offer a certain praise to his illustrious host. But when he was asked, are you sorry you won't be at G7? His answer in front of Macron was, no, I'm not. G7 is irrelevant. G20 is where it counts, and G20 includes Russia, China, India, and Brazil. And that's how he treated the charm of the host in advance of that meeting. And, of course, we saw the intensification of Berlin's determination to intensify energy interconnection by opting for Nord Stream 2. For him, the EU was weak, distracted by Brexit, by internal divisions about fundamental rights and migration, by feeble aspirational security and defence policies, and by anxieties because of Trump, legitimate anxieties, about the quality of the transatlantic relationship and its sustainability. Putin sees democracy as post-peak. He's described the idea as liberal democracy as over in interviews. And he sees autocracy as on the rise. He sees the West as decadent and in decline. Moreover, nativist politics has been boosted in the United States, in the European Union, and in the UK following the financial and migration crises. Many, such as Trump, Farage, Le Pen, Salvini, Orban, and I could go on and I won't, who deprecated the so-called globalist political elites at home, were attracted to Putin's strongman nationalism abroad. This prevailed despite the annexation of Crimea, despite evidence of election and referendum interference by Russia, despite direct and proxy cyber attacks coming from Russia, despite Putin's support for the discredited Assad regime, Despite the obliteration of Aleppo in front of our eyes, this is not the first social media war. We saw it in Syria, but we looked the other way. We're looking more closely this time round, and it's closer a bit to home for Europeans. So Putin's lesson was clear about what happens outside. He was winning at home, and he was not losing abroad. That is the logical conclusion of all of those things. And as for Ukraine, Putin's assessment of its leadership was one of pure contempt, and so the die was cast. Viewed through this lens, he felt he had much to gain and little to lose. He was wrong. Putin's invasion of Ukraine marks a point of inflection in global history and is the, moment, the most momentous 
geopolitical event so far in the 21st century. This new reality has been an eye-opening wake-up call for many democracies across the world, who, though geographically dispersed, collectively constitute the revived West. For all their contested politics, these democracies got the message loud and clear and responded to the challenge with a speed, substance and coherence that Putin and perhaps even they themselves could not have anticipated. In the EU, for example, and especially in Germany, more strategic decisions were taken within several days of Putin's invasion than had been taken decades before. Nord Stream 2 was suspended. Years of policy continuity under Angela Merkel, Gerhard Schroeder, and others before them appear to have evaporated in this instant. The long shadow of Germany's belligerent and Nazi past, long since exorcised, vanished also as Chancellor Schultz more than doubled the defence budget to 100 million euros and committed Germany henceforth to spending at least 2% of its GDP on defence in future. I want to quote from Schultz's speech to the Bundestag on the Sunday after the war started. Quote, the issue at the heart of this is whether power is allowed to prevail over law, whether we permit Putin to turn back the clock to the 19th century and the age of great powers, or whether we have it in us to keep warmongers like Putin in check. That requires, he said, strength of our own. Close quote. To the relief of its allies, German democracy is stepping up through rearmament to defend Europe's peace and security against Russia's new fascism. How ironic. History has come full circle as we look to Germany to keep the new fascism away from all of us, along with other allies. The EU also broke with long-standing taboos and created Europe's peace facility from its own resources, initially promising 500 million euros to provide weapons for Ukraine, which long had been denied. Then we come to sanctions. Russia has been hit by a rolling and escalating range of sanctions without precedent against a large state so deeply integrated into the global financial and energy system. The sanctions, as you know, cover finance, technology, energy, software, computer chips, consumer goods, sport, culture, and media. They extend from named politicians and officials and their relatives to assets freezes against oligarchs. Russia's planes cannot land, its ships cannot dock, its trucks cannot drive anywhere in the European Union and elsewhere in terms of planes and ships in the United States and uh, Great Britain. Over 600 international companies have suspended activities or entirely withdrawn from Russia. A growing number of its banks are excluded from the SWIFT international clearing system. Half of its currency reserve, which Putin had built up to 552 billion euro equivalent, is now totally inaccessible, having been chosen again by a sanction without precedent, by a united effort by the US Fed, the central banks of the EU, the UK, Switzerland and Japan, depriving Russia of access to dollars, euros, sterling, Swiss francs and the Japanese yen. Russia has the money to redeem its foreign exchange reserves, but because of the sanctions it can't access the money, making a default a distinct possibility. Although, paradoxically, after 20 years in power, the Russian economy is still relatively small enough that a default is unlikely to have a global systemic effect. What an irony for such a resource-rich state and such a long period of unbroken power in, in office. The, the, the credit rating agencies have Russia now in what they call junk bond territory, and the IMF has predicted a deep recession in Russia with a major decline in purchasing power due to higher inflation and ruble devaluation. There should be no doubt, of course, that Russian diplomacy is going to be very busy to evade and get around the sanctions. And if they want to do, you're in a university, I see many students here and it's lovely to see you, if they want to do a good postgraduate program in evasion, all they need to do is talk to uh, Kim Jong-un in Pyongyang, who is the past master. That country 
with the heaviest sanctions against any state in the world, has done all of its R&D development and delivery of its entire nuclear program and ballistic missile system while nominally being choked off from the world. And how do they do it? Through shell companies, through dodgy commodity traders, through cyber criminality, and banks and ships of convenience that facilitate illegal transactions. These are all the ingredients of invasion, in North Korea's case, done on an industrial scale. A degree of ambiguity by China and Russia also helped North Korea. They nominally sign up to the UN sanctions, but there's at least some evidence to do with banking and commodity trading that it hasn't always held. There's no doubt that Russia will pay a heavy price because of the sanctions. And their effective policing is going to involve a huge cat and mouse game and the catch me if you can kind of game the longer they're there. But this will be complicated by China's ambiguous response to Russia's invasion. China's allergic attitude to external interference in its internal affairs and China's empathy for its new best friend, Vladimir Putin. One significant comfort for Mr. Putin, as we all know and read, is the continued dependency of several EU states on Russian energy imports, especially gas. This remains a source of hard currency earnings for Russia and of a high share of Russia's government revenue, thus enhancing its capacity to wage war. It's a dilemma for those highly dependent importing states who are caught between risking economic recession and potentially deep political divisions at home and moral opprobrium both at home and abroad between different camps of opinion. Some fear that, the Russian, that Russia could bring in counter sanctions and cease all energy exports to EU. Everything is possible, but I suspect that for both parties, exporter and importer, the prospect of imposing more damage on themselves than on their adversary appears to be a limiting factor for both sides of that equation. Russia has been expelled from the Council of Europe for the war. Russia, on the UN General Assembly, suffered humiliation when 144 states condemned their invasion, which of course couldn't be done by the Security Council because of the veto, uh, which called immediately and completely and unconditionally for withdrawal of all military forces from the territory of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. But Russia did have supporters to vote against it. Belarus, North Korea, Eritrea, and Syria. I remember my mum used to say to me, you know someone by their friends, and that tells us quite a bit. They were the only states to support Russia in objecting. A third setback diplomatically happened again at the General Assembly when Russia was suspended from the UN Human Rights Council after a very high profile, uh, after the allegations in Bucha and Moshtin and elsewhere uh, as uh, land was regained. Let me turn to security and defence quickly. Denmark is planning a referendum to get rid of its opt-out from EU policy. Finland and Sweden, we know, are seriously considering joining NATO. What a paradox. Finland has 1,340 kilometres of a direct land border with Russia. And Putin, who is having a war partly to say, I'm not even allowing Ukraine to think about doing that, may end up anyway in precisely the place that he didn't plan to, to be. And so I think in all of that, and we know the intimidation that's come and talk about deployment of uh, uh, nuclear weapons in the Baltic. I think they're already in Kaliningrad anyway. And Medvedev from the Defense Council talking of military and political consequences. My prediction, I don't know if it's for Finland and Sweden to make their call, but my prediction is sovereign states with self-confidence they will call their own judgment, whatever it is, and they will not be intimidated by this kind of uh, threatening Russian diplomacy. And by the way, I'm not going to go through this, but one of the issues, and it's, it's worth a whole conference, but I don't want to go into it in depth now, NATO and Russia and who promised what and who did what. I just want to make one point here, and I'm not going to read my text. There's a multiplicity of institutional arrangements between NATO and Russia. The first one dating back to 1994, another one in 97, the Paris Founding Act on Mutual Relations, Cooperation and Security, and another one, a NATO-Russia Council established with Putin in 2002, largely about the issue of terrorism, fighting the war in Afghanistan, and so on. 
I, I, I'm simply saying there's a lot of stuff out there which makes this story a lot more complicated than some of the simplified versions uh, that I read. The NATO Secretary General, coming out of the most recent Leaders' Summit, said the following. Meaningful dialogue as we strive for before, the stuff I've mentioned but not developed, is not an option for Russia, he said. And he went on to say that the leaders agreed to, and I quote, reset our deterrence and defence long term to face a new security reality with substantially more forces in the east, more jets in the skies, more ships in the seas. Close quote. And of course, the EU's own growing and security and defence dimension will add a new strategic layer to its role as a geopolitical actor, uh, and this will be this new layer beyond the traditional roles of trade and economy that have characterised Europe geopolitically. Europe has a strategic compass, compass it's looking at its complementarity with NATO, and I've little doubt that Macron's win yesterday, along with Schultz's speech of a few weeks ago, is going to make a big difference in Europe, and watch that space. So on every front, politically, economically, diplomatically, and strategically, Putin is already paying a high price for his war of choice. But there are alternative narratives. For many but not all democracies, Putin is a pariah, leading a pariah regime. As you know, Joe Biden last December held a summit of democracies. Among the democracies invited were Brazil, India, and South Africa. All three of them abstained in the UN General Assembly vote, showing us the subtleties of geopolitics are more complex than pure black or white. I want to share with you a line of narrative from the joint China-Russia statement of February, something I would commend for anyone studying politics or international relations. Go and read that. That took a lot of preparation. Anyone in diplomacy knows how much effort you make into getting the text right before you bring the boss in for the photo opportunity at the end. I want to read you part of it. Certain states, it said, attempt to oppose, impose their own democratic standards on other countries, to monopolize the right to assess the level of compliance with democratic criteria, to draw dividing lines based on the grounds of ideology, including by establishing exclusive blocks and alliances of convenience, prove to be nothing but flouting of democracy and go against the spirit and true values of democracy. Such attempts, attempts at hegemony pose serious threats to global and regional peace and stability and undermine the stability of the world order, close quote. That is an alternative narrative. And so these two narratives coexist, the revived West and this other one. And these will continue to coexist. And by the way, when you look at trade talks and all sorts of other things, the global South is closer to this, to do with its own real politic and balanced interests than what I called earlier the revived uh, Wests. I think one of the things that may happen, we have seen after COVID a lot of rethinking about whether we should onshore production, bring things back because we were caught short or supply chains broke down. My own hypothesis, particularly to do with SWIFT and the central banking thing, is that this may accelerate the development of alternative systems by China and Russia and some others, because they will not want to allow a revived West to use the instruments of globalization as instruments of sanction to exclude them. And I think that's a serious possibility. So one hypothesis I leave with you, a scenario, not a prediction, is that any momentum to onshoring and deglobalization may actually accelerate because of the Ukrainian war. Another huge spin-off and a reality is the food price crisis. Um, if we look at the blocking of the Black Sea ports, if we look at the fact that the war has cut off supplies from Ukraine, which is the world's leading exporter of sunflower oil and a major producer of maize and wheat, the World Bank's president said that many poorer countries face a human catastrophe as prices soar, hitting the poorest hardest in terms of nutrition. 60 years ago, the UN Food Prices Index was started to track food prices. Without going through all the numbers, it stood at its highest level ever since the war in Ukraine started. And the World Bank fears that a crisis within a crisis may emerge, that heavily indebted countries 
or countries close to being heavily indebted to do with post-pandemic debt in one part, economic recession in the other, and trying to support, subsidize against the effects of huge, huge pri uh, food price inflation may indeed create a debt crisis again for those states. I think Putin hoped, looking at 2015, that one of the consequences of a war in Ukraine would be to totally destabilize the European Union with a wave of refugees. After all, he saw the kind of debate that was unleashed everywhere in 2015. And I think he saw it as another form of weaponization to destabilize the Union. Here too, he underestimated Europe's response. For the first time ever, Europe's temporary protection directive was invoked. The effect of it is to allow, starting from one year, rolling to three, and my guess, and hopefully we don't have to get there, beyond three years, it confers on a Ukrainian refugee essentially all the rights as if they were an EU citizen. The, the, the right for welfare, the right for education, the right of access to health, and within the limits of struggling societies coping with masses of people coming, the right to housing and shelter. And this is stood in the law. That was passed when I was in the European Parliament two decades ago. But it sat there unused until the Ukrainian crisis. The EU's frontline states and Moldova, where we will hear from uh, Jan Tombinsky presently, have responded with capacity and generosity on a grand scale. And I think all this improvisation, we're going to have to live with it because we still don't know the ebb and flow of what will happen. And then on the EU, President Zelensky has issued a big challenge, and Moldova and Georgia followed up quickly on applying for accelerated EU membership perspective for Ukraine. This puts enlargement firmly back on the EU's policy agenda. This is a nettle, let's be frank, that the EU has been slow to grasp over the past decade because of a mixture of enlargement fatigue, because of high levels of conditionality to gain accession, and because of political division at the level of the European Council. Bringing Ukraine or others in on an accelerated basis has major implications for security and defense, for budgetary dynamics, for institutional capacity. But this is said to be a necessary and unavoidable debate. And if you look at the fact that the Ukrainians are spilling their blood for freedom and the sovereign right to choose, and they're expressing that choice as wanting to have a European Union choice and take account of the wartime visits of the presidents of the three European political institutions, the Parliament, the Council, the Commission. It seems to me that a contract of expectations on candidate state status already has been entered into implicitly. I don't downplay the complexity, but it's very hard to switch that top off given the flow of emotion and solidarity surrounding it. The other big thing for the EU is its net carbon zero target, to be the first net carbon zero tar uh, continent by 2050. In principle, the drive to reduce energy dependency on Russia should complement and accelerate that target. And I hope it will do. And all of the indications are that this is the stated policy the EU wishes to follow. But I want to remind you that in practice, you can't take these things for granted. Recall the following, and I had a look at this especially in preparing this talk. As the leaders and national delegations left the COP26 conference in Glasgow as recently as last November, they were confronted with a post-COVID global energy supply chain, uh, supply chain problem and rising energy prices. Their first response wasn't to think about decarbonization. Joe Biden called on Saudi Arabia to deliver more oil, and he released resources in the US Strategic Reserve, and he's even doubled down on that since the Ukraine invasion. Ursula von der Leyen and others in the EU last November called on President Putin to deliver more gas, something the EU continued to call for as recently as early February of this year, even as the war clouds gathered on Ukraine's borders. Chinese authorities reverted to more coal-fired electricity generation to counter their fuel shortages. In other words, my conclusion from this is not negative, but questioning. 
The preoccupation everywhere, and especially now in Europe because of the Ukrainian war, is more with energy security, energy affordability, and energy accessibility. And in the short term, sourcing alternatives will cost. Imagine if we follow what ministers are saying, we'll take LNG, liquefied natural gas from the USA or the United Arab Emirates. We can do that. Someone on the other side hopefully has the production facility already there and the capital investment made. But it's not made on this side. The importer will need the facilities to take it, the facilities to switch it into storage tanks, the facilities to regasify it from its liquefied nitrogen form back into gas. And all that will cost a lot of capital expenditure. And if I was an investor, I'd want a reassurance I'd get payback. And you won't get payback if you're not doing it for 25 or 30 years. So these are real things now that come on the table that policymakers are going to be confronted by. But the last thing I want to talk about, and I should get to it, is in facing reality, is to go to Ukraine and confront the most urgent reality of all, which is the war. Russia assembled the largest military force in Europe since the Second World War, invaded Ukraine on four fronts on the 24th of February. Kiev from the north, Kharkiv from northeast, Donbass from the east, and the Kherson Oblast from Crimea. In the previous five years, Ukraine had spent $20 billion on defense. Russia, $350 billion. Russia assumed, as we all saw, a quick victory and seems not to have made contingency plans for alternative scenarios. Kyiv was the prime target with the aim of decapitating the government of President Zelensky and replacing it with a puppet, spare part Ukrainian elite. Doubtless, there were numerous FSB-sponsored sleepers in place awaiting their hour of mobilization. Russia's biggest failure was to underestimate the Ukrainian will to resist. They weren't the only ones. They weren't the only ones. It is hard to know if what happened was an intelligence failure on the part of the SFP or another reality of people in an autocracy having to keep the boss happy and they knew the boss's attitude to Ukraine, that they were useless, feckless, and weren't really a nation at all. Zelensky showed remarkable personal courage at a critical time in his nation's history. When their fate hung in the balance, he stood his ground. He began in his dominated war on the second front, a communications war. And one of his phrases personified for me Ukraine's heroic resistance, the whole society, not just the military, when he said, and I quote, when the Russians come, they will see our faces and not our backs. Finally, when they got their lethal weapons that were portable and with their huge motivation, they drove Russia out and by day 42, that whole Kiev front was cleared. All sorts of things, low morale, poor motivation, poor logistics, crazy communications using mobile phones and old fashioned radios that could be listened into all appear to have contributed to this and seem to have taken away some of the mystique of the prowess of Russian military. But of course, the war revealed something else. The first casualty of war, they say, is truth. And in this case, the first of Putin's lies was that it was not a war. The second of his big lies was that the war wasn't aimed at civilians, contrary to the visual, social media, and eyewitness accounts we could see. Bombed homes, hospitals, schools, shopping malls, the theatre full of refugees, including children, Mariupol, the queue of refugees waiting to escape Krematorsk. We saw then all the places that had been abandoned by the retreating Russians. Bucha, Irpin, Moshtin. I mentioned Moshtin. That was the place where the female mayor, with her hands tied behind her back, was shot in the head, along with her son and her husband, because she wouldn't bow her knee to the occupying forces. Right across this territory, there's now evidence of atrocities, summary killings, torture and rape emerging from the streets, the basements and the mass graves. All of this opens a third war, a third front in this war, the search for justice for victims. And all I want to say in relation to all of that, and I'm pleased my own country, Ireland, has been one of the 39 states in the International Criminal Court who called for an investigation of these 
acts of war crime. And investigation doesn't mean presumption. It means prima facie potential evidence of that, and that will be gathered. But I want to say one thing here about this to be realistic, confronting reality. The Rome Statute, which established the ICC, has been signed up to by many states, who was never signed and ratified by China, by Russia, or by the United States. And so they are outside its jurisdiction. And there is a way to shove them into the jurisdiction, and that is through a reference voted by the UN Security Council. And I can think of at least one country that might choose to exercise a veto. So I'm wondering, as I face this reality, will Putin or his generals or others ever face justice for this? Let's wait and see. Now what we have is, of course, more evidence of success in the south, uh, with the notable exception of the sinking of the Moskva, the Black Sea Fleet flagship. We see the battle for control of Mariupol and the relentless and devastating quality of that. And we see the unfinished business of war that continues to create there the war's current greatest humanitarian crisis as we meet and speak. What we've also seen is the desire by Russia maybe to connect up to Moldova in Transnistria and to sweep right across and to remove all access to Black Sea and Sea of Azov for Ukraine. And now, of course, uh, Mariupol joins Grozny and Aleppo on Putin's list of infamy. But he has claimed it as a prize of victory, even as the resistance at Azovstal appears to be continuing. After the Kiev debacle, the invasion's points of attacks are now concentrated in the east. The terrain is different. The need for heavy weapons is greater. And it seems to be responded to. I read the paper, but of course, you're not told everything for good reasons. And also, anyway, lots of people lie during wars. And I'm sure lots of people on lots of sides can temper the truth to the need to tell stories. But it is very clear that so far, the graduated escalation of the supply of lethal weaponry and the nature of the weaponry has escalated with the war. None of the heavy weaponry came before the revelation of the atrocities. And no NATO military force has confronted any Russian military force and so far has avoided a greater, if threatened, escalation. I want to conclude by suggesting to you Two things. One, I think for Putin and the Russian elite around him, this war of choice has become existential. One in a way that they can't afford to lose. What the outcome will be and when and how it will happen is a matter of total conjecture during the fog of war. Putin started the war, and unless he's totally defeated militarily, he can stop it whenever he chooses to declare victory. Since he lies with consummate ease, and dominates the message that's transmitted and disseminated in Russia. That, in principle, could be any time and any circumstance of his choosing, including, but I don't expect, on the 9th of May, as Russia will celebrate its great patriotic war victory over Nazi Germany in the Second World War. Controlling the Donbass now appears to be the key strategic uh, target, and they haven't abandoned their original aims to denazify and demilitarize. So who knows what phases are left and what life cycle is left. Ukraine, of course, is more confident now in its capacity to wage war. And those who are supplying it with weapons, more confident in its capacity to use them. Putin derides Ukraine and Ukrainians. But in my view, he has become the most potent unifying force in forging the birth of a new Ukraine whose independence will have been earned not just by referendum in 1991, but through the blood sacrifice of its people today. I belong to a generation of Europeans whose entire lifetime has afforded me and us to spill our sweat but not our blood, to build prosperity on a foundation of sustained peace. Putin's savage 21st century war reminds us again that peace cannot be taken for granted. It brings to my mind a phrase that I thought belonged to history, from Horace and from poems in the First World War. Dulce et 
decorum est, pro patria mori. It is sweet and fitting to die for the homeland. As Ukrainians today, military and civilian, seek meaning for their suffering and loss, they now refer to their heroic dead, not as a glorification of war, but as a mark of respect for their sacrifice. The war may go on, and if it does, you need staying power. And I have a question mark. We have a revived West and great unity. I think if that unity is threatened, it will not be by the threats of aut autocrats. It would be populists and nativists within. Imagine after inciting an insurrection and refusing to accept elections, that last weekend, the first polls since he lost office, which he doesn't accept, put Donald Trump in the lead for the 2024 US presidency. So the long haul requires things. Already France voted for the long haul by giving Macron another five years. We'll see what happens in Assemblée Générale elections and so on, but that is there. The war will end. And when that happens, the business of diplomacy and politics will return to center stage. For so long as Vladimir Putin is in charge, there will be at least as much political sensitivity to stepping down the sanctions as there has been to ramping them up. Sanctions are a slow burn, but the longer and the deeper that they cut, the more they will deprive Putin of the ability to buy off the masses with welfare and wage bribes in future periods as the Russian economy shrinks, inflates, and stagnates. In the short term, Putin is using this new isolation to mobilize public opinion. But my hypothesis is that over time, as the effects bite, this will be a strategy of diminishing returns for the Kremlin. In the longer term, what to do about Russia cannot be ignored. Isolating it forever is not an option. Putin is not Russia. But the saving of Russia is for Russia itself to decide first and foremost. And if change comes, a geopolitically active and alert European Union must be ready to respond to it. Peacemaking is a tough task for all sides in a conflict. It will involve hard and probably divisive compromises. Ukraine will need to be able to frame any compromises in a peacemaking settlement in a wider and positive vision of its future. The European Union should be part of that vision, an anchor of freedom, of hope, and of opportunity, reassuring Ukrainians that their enormous sacrifice has not been in vain. Slava Ukraini. So I haven't been looking at my watch and I probably run over and Jan, I do apologize to you, sat patiently in Moldova. We're very pleased that you join us. As I mentioned earlier, Jan Tombinski is uh, an international diplomat from Poland of the first rank. And right now he's on mission in Moldova. And so very well placed as a respondent to pick up some of these teams, but even better because of his experience and professional capacity to add his own illumination to what it is before our eyes. Jan, I hand over to you. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur le Président, pour ce discours, cette conférence magistrale. Il m'arrive une tâche très difficile de répondre aux thèses que vous avez développées. Et je vais essayer d'être bref et structurer mon intervention sur les points que vous avez évoqués. Vous avez commencé et conclu par la référence par rapport à la Russie. Je veux maintenant essayer de m'exprimer en anglais parce que j'ai écrit quelques notes en anglais, alors je change la langue pour être plus précis sans la nécessité de traduire ma même pendant que je parle. Merci, merci et, Yann. Allez-y. Uh, first, some words on Russia. 
you mentioned several features of Russia's uh, political scene. And I wish to uh, dwell for a moment not on different texts coming from top layer of Russian politics, from Putin, Medvedev, and others uh, that we know, but on results of the thinking that goes also down to uh, We must. Ah oui, apparemment qu'il y a un problème avec le son. Il, il faut un peu créer un espace entre votre micro ah. et votre bouche. Oui. Voilà. <rire> oui. Bien. Merci. Je... Est-ce que ça va maintenant Est-ce que c'est mieux maintenant Je pense que c'est parfait. Oui. Alors, oui. La, la Moldovie, deux points <rire> dans ce concours européen. Pour moi aussi. <rire> C'est mieux de, de ne pas tenir le micro près de la bouche. Alors, back to, to, the, to, the, to the argument. This is not only the top layer of uh, Russian politics that does not digest or did not digest the dissolution of the Soviet Union and uh, the independence of a country as Ukraine, Moldova, and others. For the past two years, I was a very attentive reader of documents issued by Russian Diplomatic Academy. And the same pages were advanced in materials that were publicly available, but that serve also to educate future diplomats, to educate political science. They were considered Ukraine, Moldova, despite of formal acceptance of independence in 91 as a part of internal structure of Russia. And it reflects even today on the silence of Russian elites with regard to the war that Putin started against Ukraine, but even before the war has been started because the war was under preparation for years and we didn't hear contesting voices from Russian intellectuals or from Russian they were all united in the same idea to recreate the glory of Russia. It was appealing to a observer survey done with a hundred Russian dissidents living in different Western countries who were asked to respond to the question whether uh, Crimea should be Russian or Ukrainian or whether the war against Ukraine is justified. Only three denied it. So even those who live within our society and those who are confronted with the, the international public opinion, not cut off from different sources of information, they share the vision of the world, which is a dramatic uh, uh, diagnosis for a way of how Russians perceive the world. Then second uh, element that I wanted to, to add to uh, what uh, you have said, uh, Mr. President, this is the question uh, that, uh, or the problems that has been revealed by this war. Russia is a deeply corrupt state, and the deeply corrupt state is unable to generate a sound element within the whole system, even if this element is so crucial for this country as military sector. We observe now with uh, all these people who are engaged in the war, who lead the military effort of Russia, lack of professionalism, uh, uh, failures in management, uh, uh, the uh, complete disregard for the life of soldiers. 
this is something that is inimaginable for our society, but it reveals the truth about how deep Russia is demoralized through this authoritarian system. You are completely right stating that in this authoritarian system, people send reports to please the hierarchy, to please the superior in order to get access to career, to personal wealth, and to benefit from resources of the country. But Russia uses also something that is quite specific for Russia for both internal and external view. This is the weapon of fear. In Russia, it worked, and you have said in the, uh, the part that it was successful in governing and ruling the own society by eliminating content, uh, opposition, by uh, poisoning people, by uh, uh, suppression of free media, including uh, uh, the Ecomas visit. Last year, the Nobel Prize uh, for the liberty of speech. And this fear is also a weapon used towards our society. We observe it now with uh, different phases of uh, stepping up threats towards Western society. We had this economic threat with gas, nuclear. That Russia is now once again, and Wavrov yesterday in his speech uh, referred to a possibility of a nuclear world conflict. This is how Russia tries to impact on our society. That they know that society is under threat, they do not think rational, they think emotion. And they start first to think about how to save our own life and how to protect ourselves from even bigger damage than the one that we observe. And this threat is used as a weapon towards us. And we have to be aware how to understand. The use of religion and Russian Orthodox Church, you alluded to, but I guess we have also to say one word about how big the damage Putin does to the Russian orthodoxy and to the Russian culture in Russia. In Ukraine, the Russian Orthodox Church was uh, the majority denomination for Christians in, in Ukraine. It was the, the church that uh, had the largest number of followers. of the uh, diocese of uh, Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine call for a divorce from Moscow and even they call to sue Patriarch for accepting, uh, benedicting and justifying the war. This is something that uh, is uh, completely contrary to uh, different public interventions of uh, Putin and uh, of Russian leadership, uh, that they go in defense of true values, uh, that uh, they are defenders of uh, orthodoxy. They are also defending or pretend to defend the Russian language. Now, I encountered so many Ukrainians in Poland, we host them at home, who were Russian speakers. They switched completely to Ukraine. They say, I had such a discussion with a younger lady uh, who uh, ended up uh, at our home for one week uh, looking for shelter in Poland. She was from Bucha, from Irpi, from this region, so much hit by the war, and she was Russian speaker. She said that she always thought to educate her children in two languages, in two cultures, to profit from the openness. To, to culture. Now he said, no more. 
I will not use Russian for family reasons to educate my children. It will be a withdrawal of use of Russian language in this part of you. And third element is uh, this uh, Russia's vision of Ruskimir. What does the Ruskimir propose? Sometimes we have also to think about rationality behind uh, different, even for us, hostile concepts of, of war. This Russian Mir proposes the glory of Russia or the participation in the glory of Russia to participate in a superpower that may be a dominant element in world politics. They propose also access to huge market and resources of Russia, including gas and oil. But what this Russia near does not propose? Freedom, personal dignity, rule of law, democracy, and it does not propose modernization. You and me, we were in Ukraine in the period of tensions uh, 2015 for peace. One of the main arguments for Ukrainian, even late government of Yanukovych and those uh, who are right now in Russia, was we need to associate with the European Union because this is the only way to overcome our weakness, to modernize our country to value our potential. If we stay with Russia, we will only conserve our corrupt system and inefficiency to modernize the country. So Russia has lost attraction. And as you said, to, in closing remarks, that for Russia, for Putin, this war has existential meaning. It has an existential meaning, not for Russia, but for Putin's regime. Mm. So this regime is based on this vertical of power, on decisions coming from very top to very bottom of administration, or uh, the system that is based on the personal loyalty to a superior. I would even say a kind of a feudal system that is based on this uh, subordination and submission to the superior. And this is existential for Putin and survival of his prison. But what does this war mean for us, for Europe and for Ukraine? For Europe, you stated this is an eye opener and a game changer. We will, we shall renew with our values. This is first. We in Europe, we were always focusing on our failures, on our weaknesses, on our internal division. We need to return to what were our fundamental of our system in which uh, uh, and to value what uh, are the results of 70 years uh, almost of the European Union. This is, uh, I guess, uh, a way of reinvigorating the European thing in Europe and reinvigorating also of the legacy of Belmont. His legacy of uh, looking for solutions at the negotiation table, not at the battlefield, it's something that has created the wealth of Europe uh, as we witness it today. And we shall confront this value with values of steps, of Russian proposals of expansion 
only expansion without the ability to invest and modernize their own territory. Russia didn't use the dividend of peace after the end of the second of the Cold War to mobilize uh, and to modernize its own territory. Russia used it in a corrupt way to expand to the other parts of the world by corruption, by uh, creating dependencies, uh, by even military annexations of various territories. So returning to Jean Monnet method, to uh, what the legacy of founding fathers is one of conclusions that I would draw from uh, what uh, uh, happens today. Ukrainian future depends also on our decision. They show their determination. They show where they do belong. That their choice of Europe, their choice of Western civilization was not circumstantial. It was existential one too. And we have to respond to this call from you. At this very time in Rammstein, various leaders talk about military support for you. And we need to step up our military support for you. Ukraine is not hit by an earthquake or tsunami or flooding that we should talk only about humanitarian issues. This is a war, and war demands a weapon and means to defend. And in this war, we have to stay on the side of Ukraine with all our needs and to confront Russia. This war may only end with a military defeat of Russia. This is my firm conviction. I do not believe in a negotiating outcome of this war. Uh, negotiating outcome would mean a kind of a new compromise. We have seen what a compromise with Russia after Crimea annexation, after Donbass or to partial occupation have brought as a result. Further escalation. So we need to understand that only a heavy military defeat of Russia would stop for a perhaps predictable future other ambitions to expand. We need to create this advantage for our side of this confrontation. Ukraine, together with Moldova and Georgia, have applied for European membership. They got this famous questionnaire, hundreds and hundreds of questions uh, about uh, different aspects of uh, political, economical, uh, and constitutional uh, solutions. And uh, they got in an unprecedented way short deadline to respond. Usually countries got six months to respond. They got four weeks to respond. And they responded within one week to the first part of the questionnaire. The next, uh, the uh, second part of the questionnaire arrived only last Friday, so they have uh, uh, additional phone. This is an acceleration of history. And uh, as we all know, there is no vacuum in nature. There should also be no vacuum in you. We all understand that these countries are not completely ready and fit to uh, fulfill all the requirements of the country. We have to invent a solution that would allow them to be a part of the system, even if they are not full members of the European Union. Ukrainians pay for all these countries as Georgians have paid in 2008 with blood and 
with dead bodies for the church. We should not consider this this demand as purely administrative and legal process. We should stay on the level of this historical challenge that uh, we are confronted with now. This is my short comment, uh, sometimes a repetition or highlighting of your conclusions, uh, but uh, this is what I prepared to uh, respond to your fantastic Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, the audience. Slava Ukraini and glory to Europe. Glory to our founding fathers. With all what happens in Europe, we need to share even more what the legacy has shaped our everyday in Europe. Thank you. So, Jan, I'm extremely pleased that you could join us and thank you for your remarks. I'm especially interested in what you've described as the accelerated procedure, no room for a vacuum, and finding some space to get on with real business, even if it isn't classic full membership straight up. And it's an interesting, uh, an interesting landing zone for expectations. Now, I know here we've, we've, we've tested your patience, you've sat for a long time. Um, uh, I certainly overran my time because I wasn't paying attention to it. I was paying attention to the text I'd worked on. Now it's question time, and Jan, I'd ask you to stay on board if you would, please. Um, so I'm happy to take questions or comments from the audience. Il y aura des micros disponibles. Who would, who would like to kick off? Yes, please. Do we have someone here? Yes, please. Un micro pour, pour assister la transmission. Voilà, voilà. Allô? Oui. oui. Uh, so if you want me to ask the question in English or in French? As you wish. Okay, I'm sorry, voulez. French, to be more precise. Um, ma question is, est, est-ce que la guerre en Ukraine n'est-elle pas une preuve que nous, Européens, en tant que nation, aurions dû, aurions dû um, nous unir et prendre notre indépendance géopolitique, géostratégique, et en termes de défense, il y a déjà 10 à 20 ans, um, déjà pour, pour pouvoir avoir... Pour, pour pouvoir promouvoir nous-mêmes et totalement nous-mêmes la paix en Europe, euh, pour pouvoir euh, parler d'égal à égal avec Vladimir Poutine et la Russie. Et cela veut aussi dire euh, peut-être prendre un petit peu de distance avec euh, les États-Unis d'Amérique. Euh, J'avais une petite, euh, une petite, euh, un petit point que je voulais dire sur ça. J'ai entendu il n'y a pas longtemps une interview sur euh, d'un diplomate français sur, il me semble, européen, dont je ne sais plus le nom, euh, je peux vous le retrouver si vous voulez. Euh, il nous parlait qu'en 2006, Jacques Chirac avait proposé un plan euh, pour euh, garantir la sécurité et la paix en Ukraine. Il avait proposé à l'administration euh, euh, russe qui avait en tout cas donné une porte ouverte à une possible négociation sur ce plan. Euh, ce plan, il me semble, consistait à une, une défense croisée entre l'OTAN d'un côté et les forces russes en Ukraine pour pouvoir garantir l'indépendance et la neutralité de l'Ukraine. Et euh, lorsque le, ce, le diplomate français avait parlé à la secrétaire d'État américaine, euh, les états unis ont répondu euh, à la France en leur disant que euh, la France devait arrêter de, de, de prendre le contre-pied des Américains, déjà après la guerre en Irak où ils avaient refusé de s'engager, et ensuite, maintenant, en bloquant une vision à long terme de, des Américains qui voulaient la rentrée des pays de l'Est de l'Europe dans l'OTAN. Et donc, euh, est-ce que nous n'aurions pas dû, nous, Européens, prendre un peu plus d'indépendance pour pouvoir... Euh, totalement négocier euh, sans biais, sans autre puissance, euh, la, une paix durable euh, en Europe. Merci. Alors, Yann, je vais tourner euh, vers vous dans un moment. 
pour être très vite, et, et Yann, vous pouvez répondre peut-être même euh, avec un approfondissement, l'idée d'améliorer la politique de la sécurité et de la défense européenne, c'est l'idée de défendre la paix, qui est la fondation de notre prospérité partagée, pour garantir la sécurité et pour faire entrer l'Europe sur la scène géopolitique hors seulement de la tradition plutôt économique et le poids de, 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 de notre commerce extérieur. Et en ce qui concerne cette idée bon, chiracien ou français, en avant de Sarkozy faisant de l'entrée à, à nos temps, euh, pour moi, ça, ce n'est pas le débat. Le, le, le vrai débat maintenant, l'Europe a déjà fait un choix dans, avec un, le, compass, le compass, Strategic Compass publié pour muscler l'Europe d'un part et d'autre part pour chercher une complémentarité avec l'OTAN. La seule chose qui puisse être un problème, à mon avis, c'est la continuité, la durabilité, la capacité avec les Américains. Sous Biden, c'est la tradition transatlantique. À mon avis, la leçon, une des leçons à tirer, je n'ai pas parlé de cela dans mon discours, est que les Américains sont et étaient primordiales pour la défense et la sécurité européenne. Yann, vous avez la parole. Oui, un mot de plus par rapport à ce que vous venez de dire, M. le Président. Il y a toutes des raisons de développer la politique de sécurité de l'Europe et de créer plus de capacités européennes en matière de la défense. Mais il faut aussi voir que les dépenses de tous les autres membres de l'OTAN sont à peu près la moitié de la dépense dans le domaine de sécurité des États-Unis. C'est une question de cette autonomie stratégique de l'Europe qui implique évidemment aussi la question économique et l'acceptance de nos sociétés de dépenses, d'augmenter les dépenses, mais d'une façon vraiment euh, euh, très considérable pour la défense et ça prendra du temps pour revenir à un niveau qui pourrait être considéré suffisant par rapport aux besoins de la sécurité européenne. Et puis, c'est aussi la question, est-ce que nous sommes en mesure de garantir la sécurité hors de la frontière? Parce que l'OTAN a aussi une organisation que je vois parfois confier les demandes du Conseil de sécurité pour faire différentes opérations. Et là, il faut bien voir les conséquences de toute cette discussion. Je suis tout à fait d'accord avec la nécessité d'augmenter les capacités stratégiques de la défense Europe, mais en complémentarité avec le temps. Parce que la plupart des pays de européens sont les membres de l'OTAN. On ne peut pas eh, dépendre sur deux eh, différentes dimensions de la sécurité. En ce qui concerne le plan Chirac, j'en entends pour la première fois. J'étais l'ambassadeur de Pologne à Paris en 2006. Et on a beaucoup parlé de l'Ukraine. Je n'ai jamais entendu parler de ce plan. J'étais à Kiev. Personne ne m'a parlé de plan de Chirac euh, euh, par rapport à l'Ukraine. Je vois dans ce que vous dites, en résumant euh, ce que vous avez entendu parler à un diplomate français, que c'était une sécurité garantie par deux côtés, par la Russie et par peut-être l'Occident, je ne sais pas qui était le pays cité. Je sais très bien que les Ukrainiens n'ont pas voulu une sécurité garantie par la Russie. Parce que c'est la même
même Russie qui a tout, tout le temps remis en cause l'existence de l'État indépendant euh, de l'Ukraine et de leur donner encore un légui sur la sécurité de l'Ukraine aurait été pour les Ukrainiens euh, une solution peu acceptable. Merci, Yann. Autre question ou commentaire? Oui, à droite, monsieur. Uh, in English, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Max. I'm from Kiev, from Ukraine. I have a PhD status in uh, political science and a near 15 year experiment, experience in Ukrainian politics. So now it's a lot of fakes, a lot of true, and I can't, uh, it's a lot of chaotic information. For example, you say about war, but according to the laws or for the regulations, in 2014 start anti-terroristic operations and changed it uh, special force operations is Poroshenko, right, in uh, 2018, and Putin writes special force operations in 2022-24, all, all two, February. And I can't understand when the war is start. The war first questions. The second question is then in all of the world, we have Ukrainian meetings for the peace, even in Moscow, except one country. This country is Ukraine. The question is why we can't find meeting for peace in Ukraine. That's all, thanks. I think, I think Jan used the phrase that for Ukraine the war is existential. And right now, if Ukraine was unilaterally, it's not your question, but if I might permit myself to describe myself to answer it as a peacenik who would suggest that Ukraine should make unilateral choices to desist from fighting, it would be the death of a free Ukraine. And the hypothesis of denazification and of demilitarization would involve the establishment of a Ukraine, perhaps led by Ukrainians, but what I described earlier as a spare part elite. I think the problem now that war is engaged, and because of its existential quality, that Ukraine will continue on this path for some time. We don't know the ebb and flow. I called it earlier the fog of war. But it does seem that Russia is struggling to impose its war objectives on Ukraine. And the more that that happens, the more likely it is that Ukraine as a state will be encouraged to deepen its resistance with a view to driving out the occupier to the greatest extent possible. It seems to me if you're looking for a foundation for durable peace, you need to get the timing right. But if you get the timing wrong, you could end up with durable repression. Jan. Only a short comment in responding to the question. You are fully right in saying that words have meaning. This is what uh, the plateau has said, that uh, words shape thinking. And if uh, we use uh, false words, false denomination for different actions, uh, we may distort uh, general thinking. Uh, the reference of President Poroshenko to an uh, uh, anti-terrorist operation was his choice, uh, different, difficult to understand for others, but uh, this was a way not to uh, impose uh, a constitutional requirement to declare state of war over Ukraine. Uh, and it was still in time that direct negotiations were possible, were open between Moscow and Kiev, with a hope to arrive at a solution. Now, the war is an open war, despite of uh, how it is called in uh, Russia. 
and we have at least on our side to uh, be mindful about preservation, clear narratives about what happens in Ukraine. In all the interventions within the Western society, we shall call the war war because it's the war. Uh, then your second question, why it is impossible to have peace talks in Kiev? I guess President Zelensky would uh, be happy to uh, have Kiev as a platform to discuss the peace. But will the other side arrive in Kiev? Will the other side be able to come to Kiev? We may gather in Kiev all Western leaders, but the peace does not depend on them. The peace depends on your adversary, on Russia. Next question. Please. And then we will take the lady over there uh, in a moment, please. Je, je parle en français. Uh, simplement. Uh, la, la guerre en Ukraine nous montre la nécessité de l'intégration européenne. Ça a été un coup d'accélérateur de l'unité européenne. On a beaucoup parlé des faiblesses du côté de la Russie. On n'a pas beaucoup parlé des faiblesses de l'Europe. Que, quelles sont les faiblesses, notamment sur le plan énergétique, que vous percevez à l'égard de, de cette guerre qui, semble-t-il, va durer, malheureusement mm. bon, À mon avis, nous, on a parlé un peu sans cesse ici dans la Fondation, avec beaucoup d'orateurs sur les faiblesses, la crise financière, la crise migratoire, euh, pas mal de crises, la crise entre l'Ouest et, et l'Est sur les valeurs euh, fondamentaux, tout, tout un paquet de, de choses. À mon avis, ce moment est arrivé de ressaisir l'idée européenne. C'était Monet et Schumann, et surtout la déclaration de Schumann, 9 mai euh, 1950, qui a parlé, euh, et, et je cite, que l'Europe se fera par ses crises. Cette crise, aujourd'hui, c'est une crise sans précédent. Je sais bien, j'ai remarqué déjà, la guerre en ex yougoslavie Mais ça, c'était l'implosion d'un grand État dans ces quelques parties avec beaucoup d'écho d'aujourd'hui. De, 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 Mais cette fois-ci, c'est un État européen siégé au Conseil de sécurité de l'ONU qui a exercé un veto pour protéger tous les mensonges autour de leur guerre, de, de leur déclenchement de la guerre, et un pays qui a montré que les idées reçues de l'intégrité territoriale des États, la souveraineté, la souveraineté des États ne compte plus pour M. Poutine. Et donc, en, en parlant de la nécessité de saisir le moment, c'est de ressaisir l'idée qu'on peut créer de notre diversité une unité ensemble plus puissante que les alternatives. Et dans cet esprit, dans cette fondation, avec des telles racines que nous avons, un pas en arrière pour saisir un moment, c'était Schumann qui a parlé de, 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 de trouver les, les, une capacité de, de répondre au niveau des défis que nous avons. Ce n'est pas exactement le bon français, mais vous savez, on, it, it, the, the opening of the Schumann Declaration, talked, uh, what's the first sentence, Gilles, of, of that declaration? Oh, on peut le trouver. Mais il met l'accent sur la nécessité de répondre avec la proportionnalité qu'il faut aux défis qui sont là. Aujourd'hui, ça, c'est notre réalité. C'est un moment clé, comme le moment de Schumann de ressaisir des initiatives, de reprendre une foi partagée comme Européen et de nous doter avec des ressources pour répondre aux défis avec la proportionnalité qu'il faut. Yann, je ne sais pas si 
vous voudrez ajouter ou non euh, un mot Très brièvement. Il y a beaucoup de faiblesses de l'Union européenne. Il y a beaucoup de faiblesses dans toute la structure institutionnelle et dans les façons dont on apprend des décisions. Avec le grandissement de l'Union européenne, on est obligé à résoudre beaucoup plus de problèmes qu'auparavant, ce qui ne nuit pas autant le, process de, le processus décisionnel parce que les décisions sont prises aujourd'hui avec moins de délais qu'il y a une dizaine d'années, mais on s'occupe très souvent des questions qui ne sont pas essentielles pour le fonctionnement de l'Union. Car il y a avec 27 membres aujourd'hui et 28, il y a peu tant de questions qui consomment le temps, le travail et l'attention administrative, que très souvent les questions essentielles sont mises de côté parce que c'est plus facile de trouver des solutions sur les questions aléatoires et sur les questions primordiales. Et chaque crise nous demande aujourd'hui de trouver de nouvelles solutions et de refocuser, de réorganiser le fonctionnement de l'Union européenne et de voir où sont les vrais intérêts, où sont les questions essentielles de l'Union européenne. Je pense qu'aujourd'hui, le devoir devant notre dirigeant, c'est de répondre à la question de la sécurité et la question aussi de menace de la démocratie. Mais nous avons aussi une faiblesse qui est notre force, c'est la démocratie. Parce qu'en démocratie, on peut très souvent exploiter les différences des opinions pour affaiblir les, les processus décisionnels. On voit maintenant aussi à quel point on met le jour, met à jour les différents intérêts en Allemagne qui étaient liés avec Nord Stream. Les fondations financées par la Russie qui ont influencé les gouvernements en Mecklenburg pour donner des autorisations, même que euh, euh, cette construction ne répondait pas aux exigences euh, de protection de l'environnement. On voit aussi à quel point nos systèmes n'étaient pas munis contre cette influence nocive de l'extérieur. C'est aussi quelque chose euh, à quoi il faut trouver le remède au sein de l'Union européenne. Merci. Merci, Jean. La femme là-bas, oui, allez-y. Good evening. Good evening. Um, thank you for your insights, both of you. Uh, I come from Lithuania, Lithuania. Uh, so I have a question uh, about uh, propaganda and manipulation. Uh, well, I'm from the generation that still understands Russian, and I was taught Russian at school as well. And uh, I can see generation from generation, um, because on one hand, um, as you uh, spoke, you said uh, one is uh, Kremlin and Putin's regime, and the other is um, Russia. Mm. On one hand, yes, as uh, we cannot say that politics uh, is equal population, like mm. it's two different, of course, things. But on the other hand, um, no, from the historical perspective, uh, that you can see that years after years, all the leaders uh, in Soviet Union or in Russia, they are really creatively know how to use um, these tools, like manipulate, like how to manipulate. Uh, for those who are not well educated, they will use emotional um, techniques and methods. For those who are uh, rational, they will use the other methods. And we can see, I, I could tell like many, many stories how it is even nowadays an ongoing thing, but I think you all know. 
and all over the world, and of course, uh, elections uh, in the United States, uh, Trump and Biden, and so on and so forth, like all over the world, we could see some uh, things. So my question is, um, as Europe has such a neighbor um, as Russia, and the ongoing tradition to manipulate and uh, to create propaganda in different levels of societies, even in different countries, uh, what could be an effective um, um, way to fight against that propaganda in different societies? Thank you very much. Uh, let, let me try to start with one observation. Several years ago, I was invited to a conference that was held in the presidential palace in, in Vilnius by President Gravoskaita. And I wasn't dealing with that topic, but that topic was on the agenda. And I met for the first time in my life a junior minister politically appointed by a government whose mission was to deal with disinformation. And so the first part of my response is to understand, to do with your understanding or anyone who's been raised in uh, uh, Kiev or elsewhere, your part of Europe has a much more subtle and profound understanding of this than my part of Europe. Because your part of Europe has been bombarded with it, sometimes without too much subtlety. And I think in, in many respects, the act of civil society, the many NGOs who are working, some journalists and others who trace the source material on social media and give a lot of good voluntary effort to identifying genuinely fake news make a really important contribution. I think that generally cyber awareness, of which your question is a, is a part, has moved up the agenda. And I think one of the issues that I was fascinated to see as the European Union, already before the invasion of Ukraine, contemplated its strategic defense compass, the cyberspace is one of the top priorities. So I think my sense is you may have been faster learners because you were more exposed, and others were slower learners because they were less exposed, but we've all learned that failing to deal with this is a bit like allowing a cancer to metastasize within your political system. But I do add one other comment. If I look at populists and nativists to do with their political platforms within our own democracies, they use a lot of the same means. And so some of this cancer is from the outside, but some is generated from within. And when, when I hear political leaders, I've talked about today earlier with people about this, saying that they speak for the people, straight away I have a bit of a problem with this. Because the people who speak for the people hate institutions, hate checks and balances, dismiss free media as fake news, like more powers for themselves, and have a view that anyone who isn't speaking for the people should be described and dismissed as globalist and elitist. And these are in our societies, and these are in our politics. And Mr. Putin is able, or his minions, to feed that kind of politics, which is why whenever I made the reference earlier to that idea of those in our own political systems who despise the elitists, meaning we speak for the people and we will simplify everything. And I'm, it's usually a man. In the case of France, maybe Madame Le Pen, but it's usually men and I'm strong. I can speak for the people. I can make us great again. Those kinds of messages have ended up with all those kind of people, with all that kind of social media activity. Speaking in a very positive way over a long period of time of Vladimir Putin. Mr. Trump, Mr. Farage, 
Madame Lupin, Victor Orban, despise elitists, are disgusted by George Soros and his Open Democracy Foundation, but can speak in praise of Vladimir Putin. So I think alertness, active civil society, and the willingness to elevate this as a, a priority political mission and a strategic mission on the European defence front is important. I don't think it will stop it, but it may contain it, and it may uh, allow us to, to minimise its negative effect. Always, and I underline recognising, a good deal of what poisons us is grown at home. Jan, do you want to add anything? Only one remark. The question of use of language is very much related to the nature of the political system. In the authoritarian system, you are not afraid of lying. Mm -hmm. In democracy, you may lie, but lies have a short life. Uh, we have in Polish a saying that uh, goes, uh, that lies to walk on short legs. <laughs> uh, uh, so it is something that finally will be in a certain way, sooner or later, will be dismantled. The problem is now the generalization of lies or globalization of lies with the use of media. This is something that we do not have found till yet a good remedy to this globalization of lies. We've seen some attempts by different uh, 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 operators of internet and uh, communi global communicators what to do with it, but it is only a, 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 a tiny fragment of uh, this globalization of life. Life is easier to sell than the truth. So Jan, I want to thank you very much for your engagement. I want to thank everyone who's been here today for your presence for your interest and for your questions. I thank you on behalf of the Jean Monnet Foundation. I thank the university. Um, I look forward to being able to chat with you. Uh, unfortunately, Jan, you can't join us at the aperitif. But um, in your case, Jan, it's been great to have you. Jan, we've taken a lot of his day. He's been on our executive committee earlier from uh, Moldova and now joins us this evening. And Jan, given what you said earlier about accelerating the enlargement, we better let you get back to your new day job for the moment of accelerating, filling all those forms in uh, Chisinau. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, we, we, we wish you uh, success and good health, Jan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. It was a real pleasure. So, allons-y.